Hey everybody, today Rado runs through to call which is an excellent, excellent game from the design duo of uh, Kramer and Kiesling. In fact, this game is so well-loved and respected, it won the Spiel des Jahres uh, Critics Prize in 1999. Man, can you believe it? 1999. This is an old game. This is a modern classic, very well-loved, and I'm going to try and show why that is today, how Kramer and Kiesling are once again, even back, gosh, 15 years ago, they were the, like I said, the dynamic duo, the masters of modern, elegant board game design. We're going to show that right now today in this two-player run-through. Although, actually, it's kind of a kind of an odd thing. I just pray, sang their praises so much, and yet I'm not going to be playing the standard game. I'm going to be playing a variant that's called Mini to Call, which is was made by J. Edward Sanchez in 2007, several years after this came out. Now. Before I start going, I gotta say right up front, there is nothing wrong with To Call right out of the box. It is an excellent game. It plays very well. It is very satisfying. It is, you know, brilliant and elegant and challenging, but it is long. It is a crazy long. And Jen's, in my experience, even playing only two players, this game easily takes over two hours because the board is so big. And with the full game, you have so many tiles that towards the end of the game, Moves can take a long time because there is just so rich with so many possibilities for what you can do every round. And Jen and I find it a bit too long for us. So we really enjoy Mini to Call, which doesn't remove anything from the core game at all. It's just a set of rules to streamline and take a two-hour game and allow you to finish it with all the, you know, the, the depth and richness in about a half an hour, in about you know about seventy five percent reduction of overall play time. So that's what I'm going to be doing today, showing you how Mini to Call works. And if you're interested in learning more about it, there's a link in the show notes. You can go and download this very nice little pamphlet. Now I should say also there are a lot of various. We don't want to change the game at all. Here's just ways to c cut the length of the game down variants on Board Game Geek for this game. Mini to Call is just our favorite, in part because J. Edward Sanchez, when he made it, you know, the the it's very simple. It's just, hey, look, you know, he has this very nice picture that shows how we use another player's color to cut off part of the board, so we tighten the board up quite a bit. And then there, we have 12 specific tiles that we shuffle up into three, you know, the first four, the second four, and the third four. And so we only have 12 tiles instead of, well, I don't know, two times, three times as many more tiles in the base game. And, uh, you know, some very simple rules for how to, to cut the game down. It's actually, well, the reason I like this so much is because he spent a ton of time, you can see, two full pages of thick text where he's describing how he made these decisions, why, how he was really trying hard to ensure he maintains all the core gameplay and how he made his bounce decisions. I really appreciate that. That's not something you see in a lot of variant descriptions. And so that's why Mini to Call has climbed to the top of the ranks as far as we're concerned, because it feels like he went the extra mile. I mean, you, I can read the way he thought. And I know he wasn't just kind of doing this idly and just, ah, let's just make some changes. He gave it a lot of thought. He did a lot of testing. And Jen and I, we've played it several times this way, and we find it works very well as well. Now, it's still great to play full to call if you've got, you know, an afternoon to kill, because again, it's very long and very mentally taxing. It will exhaust you. Most of the time, we're looking for a quicker burst that we can get done in under an hour, or even under a half an hour if we're, if we're playing quick. So anyway, so I'm playing Mini to Call, and there's only a few changes. Like I said, we use a player's color who's not in the game to cut off half the board. We take out two-thirds of the tiles, and we take out, I think, about almost half of the treasures that are available to be found. And players have fewer archaeologists than we normally would, and we only have one additional camp we can set up instead of two. And that's about it. Uh, the rules don't change at all. It's just a very specific set of requirements to strip down to the bare basic essential to call. Now, another thing that's important is when you're playing Mini to Call, you must play what's called the Auction Variant. They're out of the box, there's two ways you can play to call. Normally, where uh, on your turn, you draw a tile just randomly from the top of the deck, you never know what you're going to get, and then you play. Or you can play the Auction Variant, where a number of tiles equal to the number of players, two players in this case, get drawn and displayed, 
Oh, okay, so a temple and a blank space. And then there is an auction, just a standard one where everybody keeps going around until everybody is passed except for one player, and that one player has paid to get to choose whichever tile he wants and to get to go first. And, you know, obviously then the remainder players, they vote or, you know, they bid for second place and third place and fourth place if it's a four-player game. So, the auction variant makes the game a little bit longer and a little bit more complex, but fans of Tikal, I think, will universally agree the auction variant is really the way to play the game, because without the auction variant, there can be a ton of luck that's introduced to the game based on if you get lucky and draw a good tile or you get unlucky and draw a bad tile. It can really have a big impact. So the auction variant, which is really kind of the core, you can think of the standard as kind of like the intro version where you're learning the game. And then once you're ready, this is true to call when you play the auction variant. So I'll be demonstrating the auction variant as well because I am playing mini to call. Okay. So, the auction variant means the first thing we do is we draw tiles. I've already done it. There's a tile with the temple on it that is currently worth two points to whoever can claim it. And a big old empty tile that's worth bubkis. Although it is a place that you can set up your own, um, what do you call it? Uh, why can't I think of the word? Um, camp. Right, okay. So that's interesting. Ooh. Okay, so already some strategies might come up depending on which of these tiles you get to place. So now we are going to start the auction. I'm currently the first player, and so I have to place the first bid. And we bid with victory points. We start with 20 victory points so that we have some um, funds that we can bid. I can give up victory points to go first if I want. And you know what? There's a blank tile, and there's a tile that's worth two points. I think I'll bid for that. I'm going to bid one. I'll start the bidding at one to see if I can get that. And now it goes to Jen. So she can raise me. She can raise me two or three or whatever. But you know what? I think she's going to pass. She's happy to not. So I got it. I get to go first. And so I've lost one. I have 19 points to Jen's 20 points. And I will take the tile that's actually worth something instead of the blank tile. Now, I can put it adjacent to any existing tile. And you can see at the beginning of the game, there's base camp where all our archaeologists enter the board. And then there's these three tiles, one that's empty, and two that have one-point temples on them. And so now I can put this in any of these spaces. And, let's see, I want to be able to get to this fairly quickly. So I think I'll go on ahead and slap it down like... Do it like that. Because you'll notice there's these bricks on the side. That has a huge impact on how the board evolves. I'll go on ahead and put it down like, like that. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. Okay, so I've placed it. That's the first thing I did. You know, I, I, we bid, I paid, and now I took the tile I wanted and placed it. And now if, there, if, there, if we were playing a three or four player game, there would be another round of bidding and so on. But it's a two-player game, so um, we are going to now continue. And let's see. Yep. Jen, I'm the first player, Jen's the last player. And so this defines what I can do on my turn. This very, very nice hieroglyphics player aid. Now, this is an action point game. And every on your turn, you are given 10 APs, which is what the rules call action points. 10 action points to spend. And you can spend them amongst these, what is it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 actions you can do, although they cost different things. You can bring more archaeologists onto the board. Every archaeologist I want to move into base camp, that costs one action point. I can move archaeologists around. That costs me action points equal to the number of bricks they're going to step over. Uh, and let's see, I can uncover more levels of a temple to make temples worth more points. Um, that cost me two action, two AP. I can, I can uncover treasures, although no treasure tiles came out, so there are no treasures right now. But that, if there were, uh, that would cost me three AP. I can swap treasures with other players for three AP. I can set up another base camp out in the jungle someplace, which cost me five. That's half. That's a big move. Or I can claim a temple as mine, and no one else can ever have it, and that costs five A. So now I'm going to spend these ten action points, and then it will be Jen's turn. So how am I going to do it? Well, let's see, I want to run over here and claim this thing. So I think the first thing I'll do is I'll spend two of my 10 and summon, you know, or basically, you know, bring in two archaeologists. I'm the orange player. So I spent two of my 10. Then, now I want to move these guys over to this temple. And to move, remember, it's one point per brick. So if I want to move a guy from here to here, you can see there's one brick between it. If I want to move a guy from here to here over to this temple, it would cost me two action points because there's two bricks. It would cost me one, two. But I want to get over here, so it's going to cost me one and then two because of the way I laid this down. If I had laid this tile down like this, it would cost me one and then two, three. 
But I did it in such a way that I could get over there in the cheapest, fastest way possible. So I've spent two, and now here's three, four, five, six. I've spent six of my 10. Got four more action points. Now I'm going to try to uncover more of this temple. And what that means is that costs two action points. And so I, in uncovering more of this, you know, peeling back you know, a lot of the foliage and whatnot, I have turned this from a two point temple into a three point temple. And that cost me two. I've got two more action points. And I think I'll do it again. I'll turn this from a three point into a, oh, where are they? Oopsie. Got my piles mixed up. There it is. Into a four point. So this is now a four point temple. It's worth the most points in the game. And now, doing this action twice, that's why I moved two guys over here, because I have to have a different guy for each upgrade. Although, you can only upgrade a temple twice on your turn. So even if I'd move another guy over here and I had more action points, I would not be able to upgrade again, because you can only upgrade it twice per turn. So that was my turn. Two points to get them out, and then four points to get them both over here, and then four points to upgrade this thing twice. My turn is over, and I'm sitting on a valuable four-point temple, which I will score potentially twice in the game. In Mini to Call, there is a scoring opportunity that happens halfway through the deck, and then one that happens at the end of the game. In Full to Call, if I recall correctly, I think there are three scoring opportunities instead of two. Okay, so now it is Jen's turn. She will take the tile that she didn't have to pay any money for, and now she gets to put it someplace. And where is she going to put it? Ah, considering the way I did things. Let's see. One, two. So she could do that. She could put it here. She might do something like this. Yeah, I think she will. She's going to go for a very, very different tactic than me. All right, so she's placed it. And um, you know it's, it's totally empty, but empty spaces are where you can build your own camps. And so what Jen's going to do is, she, she's got 10 action points. She'll spend one to bring a guy out here. And then two, three to move over here. You can see a single brick, a single brick. So she's got seven points left. Now she will pay five points to put down another base camp. So that means she has, what was it? It was a one, two, three plus uh, five is eight. She has two more actions she can do. Now, in a mini call, you only have one base camp, so Jen's never going to be able to put another one. But she has now created a new base of operations for her that will become a shortcut to get to other tiles that are out here. Me, because I only have the base camp that we both share back here, if I bring guys into the board, I got to walk them all over the place. Jen now has a shortcut. She can bring guys in the future directly out here. And that's what she's going to do. She has two more actions. I believe she'll spend her final two actions and bring two more guys here. So now she's got three people out in the field. Okay. And so now we are ready to move on to round two. And so we draw two more tiles. And it is, this is a tile that when we put it out here, we'll have three, you can see three treasures on it. And here's the other one. A tile with four treasures. Okay. And now you can also start to see this tile, which has three treasures, there is only one entrance into this tile. You can kind of imagine this is on a very, very tall hill, and there's a steep incline you can climb up, and it's all sheer cliffs on the other sides. Because, you know, if, I, if this gets put down like this, let's say, then to be able to get into this tile, you can't travel back and forth from here to here. You can travel from here to here, but it costs one, two, three, four, four action points. Or you can travel from here and it only costs one because there's only one. So the way you put these tiles down can have a huge impact. And so there's this one that has three and then there's this one which has four. And so once again, we start the bidding. And now, since um, Jen was the last player of the first turn, it, it, um, I, you know, we go clockwise again, that leads to me, I once again have to place the first bid. And you know what? I've already lost some points. Although, you know, these are very close in value. I mean, this one's clearly better because it has four treasures and there's only two um, steps on it. Whereas, the, you know, and plus a, a little single short step here. Whereas this one costs, um, only has three treasures on it and it's much tougher to get to. So this one is arguably better. So you know what, that guy will. I will bid one to try and be first because I want to do that. And this time I think Jen will pay. She will bid two. And so Jen is going to bid two bucks, or points rather. And now do I want to raise to three? I don't think I want it that bad. So I'm going to give it to Jen. So Jen pays two. And so now I'm in the lead. 
and Jen gets to go first. And now this is interesting. That means Jen just got to do two turns back to back. She was the last player on the last round, and now she is the first player in this round. And those kind, you know, it might not make much of a difference early in the game, but you know, aligning using the auction so you can take two turns uninterrupted is incredibly powerful. Let's see. So now Jen paid her two points. She gets to go first. She can take either one of these tiles. Let's see here. And what she wants to do, I think she'll take the more lucrative one and she'll put it over here. And now what that, and then so then, you know, there's four treasures, so we just grab four random treasures. One, two, three, four. And what Jen has done is, she's kind of put this in a place that is tougher for me to get to. Because if I want to have guys who come into base camp, they've got to come in here, and then they've got to walk all the way up here. Um, one, two, three turns to get up there. Whereas Jen, she can just get there in one turn. So she can own this much more easily. If she really wanted to cut me off, she could play it like this. And then, it, you know, it costs her two action points to get her guys in here. But it would cost me one, two, um, you know, one, two, three, four. It would make it even more expensive for me to get in. Whereas still, it's relatively cheap. But Jen's just going to go for the cheaper way. And she's hoping that this is going to mean that she gets to kind of own and control this place. All right, so she's placed the tile, and now she gets to spend 10 action points like always. And now here's where I think she's going to make a big move. She, she's got these three guys she left out from last turn. She's going to spend one, two, three. Three guys. So she has seven points left. She has moved in on my temple, and now Jen has the majority of dudes. You know what? Actually, I think she will place this like this, just to make it a bit more expensive for me. So, she, um, although still relatively cheap, actually, if she wanted to make it really expensive, nah, nah, nah. Yeah, she'll just go like that. Okay. So, she has spent three of her seven actions to move in on my territory. She has seven points left. Next, she is going to pay two points to turn this from a level four into a level five. This temple is worth five points. Now, when we get to the scoring round, which could either be um, rounds three or four, we don't know. We know that the, when the volcano gets drawn, that's when scoring is going to happen. And it could either be in round, and you know, we're, we've gone through the first turn, we're on the second turn. Now, it could either be in round three or round four. And I can see that a D tile is on top. So that means it, you know, it could be here, or you know, it could be in the next one. Well, actually, I mean, I, I, so I don't know. There's a 50-50 chance. If this C tile had been on top, then I would know that there, it's less likely that we're going to do scoring next round. But right now, I, it could very well be that we're going to score immediately next round. And so, Jen is trying to really put a muscle on this so that she can lock it up for herself. And that's what she's going to do right now. She has five points left. She spent one, two, um, three to move three guys in here. And then she spent two guys to level this up from a level four to a live temple. And now, her last action, she is going to spend her final five points and claim this temple as her own. Now, to claim a temple, you have to have the majority in a given tile. And Jen does. She's got three guys to my two. If she only had two, nobody could claim this temple. And in fact, nobody would score this temple because we're tied. So, that's why Jen is moving in here fast before the scoring happens so she can grab it for herself. So, she is spending her last five action points, and that means this temple is hers. Only she can score it. It doesn't matter. I could put 10 guys in this, in this tile. It doesn't matter. Jen will always own that five points. So that's 10 points she's locked in. Five at the halfway point, and then five points at the end of the game. Now, she did pay a penalty for it, though. These other two guys, they're here as well. Basically, Jen has just permanently lost um, three of her, what is it, 12. She has lost a quarter of her archaeologists. But she is locked in 10 points. All right. And you really only need to put one there. You can just take the other ones and remove them from the game. That's generally what you do. Because sometimes you have really little skinny tippy tops of temples. So anyway, so that was Jen's whole move. Okay, and because she, you know, in her future move, she'll be able to deploy more guys here really quick and get over to these treasures. So now it is my turn, and I've suddenly got two guys standing out here in the jungle without anything to do because Jen just made that move and swooped out. And I put a lot of work into that temple, and Jen is reaping the benefits. So anyway, so it's my turn. I get to place this tile now, and. You know, I guess I want to put it in such a way, since these guys are now sitting around with nothing to do, I could think, I could spend one, two, three, well, it would cost me one, two, three, 
four, five, six to move them over here and I could start trying to pick up these treasures. Or instead, I could say, hmm, what would I do? Oh, uh, see, this is an expensive tile. Hmm. What do I want to do with it? You know, I don't want to put it like this because then it costs five action points just to even get to those things until at least another tile gets built up and then there's maybe a cheaper path that's found. Yeah, I could do something like this. That's interesting. I could do something like that. All right, so we'll go with that. And then three treasures get put on it. One, two, three. Okay. And now I've got my 10 action points to spend. So I could spend six of them to move them all here. That's crazy expensive. Although it's going to cost equally, you know, if I summon a guy here, it's going to cost me one to summon him and then one, two, three. So no matter what, whether we go this way or this way, it's going to cost three action points to get to those treasures. Hmm. <clears throat> but the thing is, it costs three to go this way. For Jen, it costs one, two, three, four. So putting it this way means she doesn't really get any benefit for having this camp she set up out here in the forest. So, let's see, what am I going to do? I got my 10 action points. I am going to try and move in on this temple that Jen thought, or th these treasures that Jen, Jen thought she was putting out of reach. So I will spend um, one, two to move these guys here, and then three, four, five, six to move them there. All right. So now I've got two guys out here because there's no reason for them to stay over here because that temple is kind of lost to me. Now, so I've got four points left. To collect a treasure costs three points. So I can only do, collect one of these treasures. I'll just grab the one off the top. And I found the, the Jade Mask. Now, that is worth when we score one point. Let's see. Oh, since I can only get... Well, let's say, hold on a second. Let's think of this over through again. I'm definitely... Okay, I'm definitely going to spend one, two, three... Four, five, six. So I spent six points to get one treasure, the Jade Mask. Now the reason I was thinking I'd move two guys over here is because if I've got two guys here, I could pick up two treasures. But it turns out I didn't have enough action points anyway. So let's say I only moved one over here. It was um, three, six. Now I've got four more action points I could spend. And I could spend three of them moving another guy here so that next round I could make a run and try to pick up two more of these treasures and try to get a monopoly on those treasures. Or I've got four more points. I could move a guy over here and so now I've got guys on two different treasures, so I could start collecting treasures from two different locations. Or, I mean, I've got four more points. I could just bring out four more architects, or you know, not architects, archaeologists, so that I could really start blitzing the board. I could maybe start trying to you know, take control of these clicky temples that are right out front. And don't forget, also, I haven't even mentioned this guy, but I've also got the foreman. This is a special guy who is the same. He moves the same. He costs the same to summon. The only difference is when you're getting into majorities, his presence counts as three archaeologists instead of one. So anyway, so I've moved this guy over here. I've got four more action points. What do I want to do? Let's see. Um, what the heck? I will. I will move this guy. One, two, three. So now my team is split up, and I'm going to start digging up treasures like crazy in both of these locations next round. Now I've got one more action point, and I will bring out my foreman so that I can start trying to make a stronger push on majorities. Let's see. Although now here's the tricky thing. That's the thing I got to think about. Jen's locked in five points. I've currently locked in one point with this Jade Mask because a single um, ta treasure tile is worth one point. If you can get two of a kind, you get three points. If you get all three of a kind, you can get six points. If we go into scoring very, very quickly, I might not be in a good position to score much. Well, that's not entirely true. I'll be able to pick up at least two more treasures, but it's very luck of the draw. That might only be three points if I don't get any doubles or triples. So who knows if I'll, if I'll succeed at that. But I will also have a chance to move this guy out, and I'll be able to... Yeah, okay, I'm going to live with it anyway. Okay. So we've both done our 10 points, and now for the third round, we draw, and we'll find out if this is going to be an opportunity for scoring. Oh, it's so dangerous. If, yeah, okay, we'll see what happens. All right, this is a five-point temple, and the, the volcano is going to be one of the Ds. So here's where we find out. Is it the volcano? Will there be scoring? Yes, there will. Okay. That means... Now, there's not scoring immediately. Scoring won't happen until a player claims this volcano, which means we're going to have to do a bid again. And now this is going to be the most important bid we've had so far. Um, to find out if who is going to do the volcano, which means who is going to get to score first. When the volcano comes out, when somebody claims a volcano, everybody gets to score. But the player who got the volcano gets to score first. And that gives them an opportunity to maybe lock down more temples or grab more treasures, because there's only a finite number of treasures. 
So that's the situation, but I think we're going to stop right there. If you'd like, you can hit the button that's on screen or follow the show notes and we'll go through an extended playthrough. I'll demonstrate how scoring works. I don't know, depending on how it goes, maybe I'll play through an entire game. We'll see. But if you'd like, you can hit the button on screen or follow the show notes in five, four, three, two, one.